Hi, my name is Andrea Change and I'm with the Guild Literary Complex. I'm the executive director. Tonight is Surviving the Mic, Speaking Poetry to Power. Uh, just to let you know a little bit, um, the Guild Literary Complex is a 30 year old grassroots literary arts organization creating performance-based events in and around the Chicagoland area. We try to partner and collaborate with other community groups on social and restorative justice issues providing uh, arts, um, in the form of language and performance and along with advocacy uh, programming for marginalized voices. So tonight is a special night um, in honor and recognition of the Sexual Assault Awareness Month, the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation and the Guild Literary Complex presents Surviving the Mic, um, celebrating their seventh anniversary is my understanding. Um, I want you to join us this tonight uh, to hear some great poetry, have a, a, a dialogue with uh, members of the Surviving Mike's team and centering those voices and on the lives and experiences of survivors of sexual harm. Um, this evening we'll feature performances from um, Anjanette Curti, Cheryl Lane, Nikki Patan, who is the founder and executive director for Surviving the Mike, Jackson Santi, Mojde uh, Stokely, uh, Sante Harden Tate and Ona Wong. Um, thank you so much to Surviving the Mic for having the Guild be a part of this event and also to Case, uh, Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation for partnering with the Guild for this event. Um, I am going to be your host and we will have uh, performances by uh, several, of, again, of the members from Surviving the Mic uh, and organizers from Surviving the Mic. And then we'll have a discussion that sort of covers some of the topics, including um, what Surviving the Mic is and some other information with regard to um, uh, sexual exploitation. So uh, it'll be an interesting night, I guarantee you. Um, bring a tissue. Um, we also have on deck, um, if you are feeling uncomfortable with some of the language or feeling triggered, um, there is someone who's going to be online and Nikki will introduce them from case who will be here to sort of help address those needs as you may have them. But I'd like to first introduce Nikki Patan. Um, besides being a, a just a dynamo um, uh, and a Jamaican because she has like 40 jobs, including just being a mom and a but she's been featured in the Guardian, the Chicago Tribune, HBO's Deaf Poetry Jam and on international television as a and radio as a writer, producer, designer, and survivor. Nikki has been um, just advocating, performing, and educating uh, in this area for over 20 years. She's performed at the National Black Theater in Harlem, Brooklyn Museum, Lynx Hall, Black Artist Retreat, uh, Expo Chicago, and many other spaces throughout the United States and internationally in New Zealand and Australia. In 2014, um, she made history when she addressed the United Nations in Geneva, Switzerland on behalf of Black women survivors of sexual violence in the United States. And I know that she had a chance to do that again uh, this year in 2021. Um, she holds an MFA in creative nonfiction from the University of Southern Maine. She is a recipient of Three Arts Make a Wave Award in Music. And also um, of all of those awards, um, during our 30th anniversary was named one of the guilds 30 writers to watch. Um, again, as the, the, the uh, founder and executive director, she is also a community engagement director or the community engagement director for Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation. Um, her work can be found on NikkiPatan.com. That's N-I-K-K-I-P-A-T-I-N.com. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, stand up in your seats. A rousing round of applause for the great Nikki Patan. Yeah, yay! <laughs> well, okay, there we go. I'm unmuted. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much, Andrea, for that rousing introduction. I appreciate that. I always love the way that you introduce people because, um, you know, you actually like get into it instead of just chit chat about it. Um, <laughs> so I appreciate that. Um, I hope everyone is doing well this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us for 
our uh, event this month for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. If you can notice, my hair is turquoise and folks are rocking turquoise in various ways and configurations um, throughout the folks who are featured uh, tonight because that is uh, the color for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, a couple things before I read my piece. The first is that I would like to introduce uh, someone who is not performing tonight, but who is a, an essential part um, of the Community Engagement Department at CASE, as well as uh, a lot of the work that we do at Surviving the Mic. And her name is Anika Sterling Flores. Um, you will see her as a panelist um, in the list. And Anika uh, has so graciously agreed to provide our emotional support uh, services for this evening. So if you need to chit chat with someone, if you need to connect with someone um, for some resources, um, Anika is here for that. Um, and so we're super uh, excited to have her. Um, I'm just trying to look to see if I can I don't think Anika is actually, oh, there she is. Okay, Anika is here. Um, and so anyhow, um, we're super thrilled to have uh, Anika here this evening. And if you need uh, to reach her, um, you can chat her. And I'm, we're gonna change uh, her role to one of the panelists so that you can chat her if you, if you need to. Um, and you can connect with Anika. Um, let's see here. Anything else? We are also going to, um, drop the link, um, to our community, uh, guidelines. Yes, most day. Anika is a true gem, uh, to our family, um, and to our survivors. And so we're so grateful, uh, to have her here. Thank you, Mojde Stokely for dropping our community guidelines in the chat. We're not going to take up any time by reading those, but if you want to check out sort of how, we hold space and the way that we do that, please click that link um, so that you can see the way that we get down um, at Surviving the Mic. Um, if you need some additional resources, hotline information, crisis line information, um, trauma-informed counseling or healing services, um, hit up Anika and she can send you the link uh, to our online digital resource guide and interactive map. And with no further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and read this poem um, so we can stay uh, on time this evening because we have a lot of brilliant people uh, to get through. And I'm super, super thrilled and humbled um, to be reading alongside the fine folks this evening. They are just my favorite people, aside from my child, and my mama, favorite people in the whole world. All right. Um, so this piece is called Surviving Something. According to some Black folks, Black survivors of sexual and domestic violence brought it on themselves. Followed up by vigorous insistence that not all Black people are like that. The good Black people, the respectable Black people are absolutely not like that, darling. They're fierce, they're elegant, brilliant, successful, educated Black excellence. Not somebody's survivor, not somebody's victim, not somebody Black-eyed, baleful, bodily integrity violated, being forced to endure for pleasure, profit plantations, power, reduced to producing for the very bottom of lines. Such pride we take in those who have managed to adjust to the sickness of this society. We diagnose us who chase against toxicity, who lack medicine to make peace with iniquity as not all there. Ghetto hood, ratchet, ignorant ass Negroes, bitter, angry, black baby mama, thugged out thought crack kids who just don't want to do no better as not all of us are like that yet. I am one of those, a survivor and a black. I am the talented 10th out of 10th person I know to be raped choked, slapped, punched, kicked, bitten, lied to, cheated on and with, mercilessly molested, abandoned, fallen through dirty dozens of cracks, roses pounding against concrete, trampled by pampered feet. We exist here and there across spans of genders, sexualities, sizes, classes, abilities, and accessibilities on stages, pages, ages, in classrooms, courtrooms, corporate boardrooms, church choirs, and trap houses, surviving in the blur of intersectional invisibility. All surviving something in between lines of black, which intersect all great grid of universe woven tight with black matter, how it holds the weight of gravity without backbreaking black, blowing breezes sweet black in mild, surviving nothing to live for with wielding wind gone ballistic, ripping black from the land, stripping blood from backs that were always strapped always strapped, we still haven't come back from that. Trauma snaking through DNA, we time travel. Conduits branded into our ribonucleic rivers carrying everything in its streams, black watery schemes, rippling serene, lapping surface muting screams of those who just didn't make it. Those who did can't shake the hatred. We are neither post-racial or post-traumatic. When present day black lives still don't matter, stay splattered across concrete, police car, foster care headlines, stress disordering our everything. Can't you see? 
you're surviving something just like me. You may have never seen yourself bloody with grief of someone else's cruelty born of their own lack of healing. You may have never looked broken, skin always touched with love. But if what you are is black, something, something has laid you low, made you bend and carry what was not yours. Not so different from me, from the least of these, all of us black, all of us surviving something. Thank you. Thank you, Nikki, for that. Um, and that's a great opening. And I want to sort of clarify for folks who are sort of not necessarily familiar with surviving the mic, if you could just say, tell, tell a little bit about surviving the mic so folks have uh, a better idea of the organization itself. Yeah, for sure. Um, so surviving the mic, um, Oh, thank you, Kaitha. Our fearless executive director from Case is here in the house. Kaitha Morris Hoffer, good to see you. Um, yeah, so surviving the mic is is um, you know really uh, something that got started um, about seven years ago, and you know we started as a ten week workshop series that I thought was going to be a one off, and that now seven years later has turned into a bi monthly um, you know writing workshop series, a monthly open mic that's that ho that is hosted by Chanel Lane. Um, and, and really, you know, it's an organization um, of folks. It's a group of survivors who sort of come together and who do work together. So this is survivor-led work over the years, our community guidelines, the way in which we teach workshops, how we hold space has been shaped by the survivors who are in the space with us. Um, but also, I think in addition to that, um, and maybe more importantly than that, I think of surviving the mic as a methodology. It's kind of the way that we do poetry. Um, it's not just a group of folks who get together or sort of what you traditionally think of as a nonprofit or, or even because it's, it's never been like a 501c3. It's seriously a labor of, you know, sweat and love um, from, from all of us. Um, but more than anything, it's, it's sort of a way that we work with survivors to keep folks brave, um, to keep them feeling like they can share the things that they need to share um, and that they can walk away from that experience um, feeling hopefully uh, heard and held um, and not further harmed because that's our whole point is that we want to make sure that people can get what they need in terms of writing craft, performance craft, being able to share their experiences, their lived experiences um, and walk away feeling really good about that, feeling amplified um, and lifted up. That's that's amazing. And, and I, 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 I think it's a value because you give people a conduit to sort of work through their experience. I don't want to use the word pain, but to work through their experience. And poetry is valuable um, in that for any number of reasons, but specifically for that. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, so as we go forward, I want to make sure that um, we get a chance to hear from everybody. So the next person I want to introduce is Anjana Kurti. Uh, Anjana is in London, is a London local working in finance and sustained by arts, activism, and chosen family. In 2020, she made a commitment to dissipating generational trauma and carrying forward only the superlatives found in the heritage and host cultures woven through her life. That's a mouthful, so you're gonna have to explain that a little bit, um, Ajna. Um, Ajna has been a growing part of the Surviving the Mic team for the last three years, beginning with her role coordinating the wellness initiative for the National Poetry Slam, I believe that was held in 2019 or 2018. Um, in this year of disconnection, she has been glad to connect with survivors through our inaugural publications uh, and virtual programming for Surviving the Mic. So I want to say thank you, to, uh, Anjane, for joining us and uh, welcome. Thank you so much, Andrea, for having us. Uh, Andrea, sorry. This piece is called Handle. Sometimes I mistake my spine for a door handle to the men's toilet, something men must touch so they can do their business. A wordless thing of utility, but not sentience. Sometimes I am reminded that the whole standing length of my back from my buttocks to where my shoulders have learned to slouch is a handrail by the sliding doors inside a tube carriage. 
During rush hour on Sadiq's London Underground, a man may need to brace himself, pressing all his flesh against any of the railings on the tube, like me, breathing on it and driving his knobbly appendages into it. Since it is rush hour and we're all cheek to handle, it would be uncouth for a fellow traveler to speak up, instead observing the handrail shrink and shift while the owner of appendages steals the shelter of my buttocks. It took me four stops to be sure, moving in small shuffles and being followed each time. I said something and the man jumped in earnest shock that this was a talking handrail. He alighted at the fifth stop and the useless bystanders regained the power of speech to perform outrage. Sometimes I forget about the emergency pull cord dangling from my forearm like a loose vein, conveniently located for emergencies, such as when men in dance venues see me taking up floor space with a femme dancer. Luckily, there is a string just there to tug, accessible despite our whirling on two. Heroically, a man pulls the cord to forcibly disengage us and mercifully rescues her, me, himself. I have danced all over the city since I was 16. And of course, boys will be boys and protect stalkers and predatory promoters. And so I have stopped dancing as much as I need to. Panic buttons can also be handy at 2.30 a.m. at Hoban Station after a performance around Christmas. A drunk man pressed the panic button on my elbow because two femme dancers were on their way home, arms linked. His slurs were slurred and there was a sledgehammer in his other hand. He came from behind, so he hadn't even seen my sparkly eyelids or false lashes and I had changed out of my costume before I left to go home because I know if he had seen glitter or a catsuit, then this would have been my fault. There was broken glass and CCTV and plenty of kind British transport police officers to take our statements and to pull him aside for questioning. And eventually there were half a dozen witness reports, but not enough for consequences. We were finally released from the office at 5 a.m. We were assaulted, but not broken enough or perhaps not worthy enough to be safely escorted home. I never remember how enticing the mechanical button is that sits in the small of my back. Depressing it must clear a path for male revelers to gain safe passage past me or for colleagues to reach the staff kitchen unharmed. When working, I must keep in mind that my forearm is a banister for my male coworkers. Remember that sometimes my thigh is an armrest a safe harbor for men in this uncertain world. At one workplace, there was a man who had sat working at that same front desk for 30 years. To make a nice change, he would steady himself on this banister when it arrived in the mornings. He was too adored an office relic for me and the rest of us to be believed. I never see femme bodies with a collection of ergonomic extrusions they must be. I never notice others' handles in time, so I'm always gripped by rage. After months indoors and a long outgrown manicure, I showed up to a family owned salon. A woman took her time painting my nails with their power color, and I was grateful. The shop door was locked, so each visitor would need to wait to enter and have their temperature checked and their hands sanitized. I felt safe outside my home. It was familiar, but hazy. The owner welcomed a man in from the council here to police pandemic safety measures. He was satisfied and complimentary, this being his fourth uneventful inspection here. The owner held the door open for his exit and he couldn't resist leaving a handprint. I had been so at ease when it was just us, felt so fuzzy about this local business, safely caring for staff and clients and community alike. I was so at ease that I failed to notice this gleaming door handle jutting out from the owner's back, regrettably installed to match the front door. His was an effortless error, an inevitable oversight, utterly understandable. 
The pandemic policeman mistook the woman for the door, touching her back instead and exiting in a flurry of congratulations for health and safety compliance. A council lanyard, face masks abound, and a fucking pandemic were insufficient encouragement to use a door handle where a businesswoman could suffice. How different indeed men and women are. One not so much objectified as an anthropomorphized collection of objects, handles and buttons. The other so personified as to be revered in acknowledgement despite absence. Oh, why not contact your father? Not married yet, not even a boyfriend, only daughters. What a waste of your questions, your breath, your choices. If only you had chosen to breathe better questions, I could have changed your life in four answers instead. Sometimes I forget my body is a door handle to the men's toilet, something that needs to be touched for uninvited fools to be relieved of their shit. Thank you, Anjana. That was, uh, well, you know, I, every, I, I, some of the, we, well, let me start all over. When we were planning this event, part of our process was to sort of do a, a pre-recording. And so I had a chance to hear some of those stories um, beforehand. I didn't hear yours, Anjana. And, um, but I will say that um, there's something familiar about when survivors talk about what they've gone through. I think that the challenge is not to survive it, but acknowledging that you're a survivor because we've all had those encounters at some point. And um, no matter, even not just being a woman, but just being a sexual person or, or, or being identified as a sexual person to somebody else, whether you want that or not. So it's, it's, um, Again, the, the stories are the, the lines of the stories always beat familiar because you know you've been in that circumstance if you understood that situation. Um, which which brings me to the next person, um, Jackson Santi. Um, I, Jackson is a poet and an essayist uh, with a professional background in student <clears throat> success coaching. Um, he's both a writer and a youth advocate, and his work hopes to echo and uplift unique capacities for resilience. Um, Jackson resides in Chicago with his partner and is currently pursuing a master's in social work to become, a cer to become certified as an attachment-based family therapist. Um, I know there's more in him besides what he's gonna show you tonight. So if you want more stories and poems, you can follow him on Instagram at the great Santini, the great S-A-N-T-Y-N-I Santini on Instagram. So uh, thank you everybody and welcome Jackson. Thank you everybody. Uh, this will be the first of my two pieces and it's titled Photosynthesis and Other Life Lessons. <clears throat> I'm walking down the aisle of the frozen food section, my line of sight locked on the frost tinted windows of tasty tundra as I look for my two best friends, Ben and Jerry. My stomach aching for the rich delicacy, my tongue tantalized by anticipation of half baked heaven. And then he approaches. Eyes that invade my entire body, a scowl that turns sweetness into sour a map of wrinkles that today I wish I could navigate just to find who hurt him. He asks me what I am and I say nothing. Lurching towards me, I glare down towards the linoleum. He tells me that God wouldn't make something like me. My stomach still aches, but my desire for sweetness has subsided. My tongue stays limp. And even when I am long out of the frozen food section, I still feel cold. Years pass and I still yearn for the meaning of my existence. I try to seek solace within the covers of my other identities, but masculinity has a height requirement. I spend half my life writing to him. 
half my life throwing pain onto pages, painting stanzas into self-portrait. I find myself for the first time in years writing an open letter. I am not a dwarf. I am a person with dwarfism and I do not suffer from dwarfism because to suffer is to experience something unpleasant. I do not suffer from dwarfism. I suffer from the maltreatment imposed upon me because of my dwarfism. And that pain is not pinpointed to my genetic makeup. It is deeper than my scalpel drawn scars. The pain that I experience is from the ignorance of others. It is from the tourist who follows me down the street incessantly demanding that I stop for a picture. The woman on the train platform needlessly inquiring the sizes of things she cannot see from staring me down deadpan on the train platform. It is from the club goer who told me I've always wanted to fuck a midget. It is from the six men who assaulted me. This letter cannot tell you to fully understand my experience. That is why it is personal. My experience remains my own, but my oppression is shared. I was one of the many who was born in the dirt. But when you throw your shit on us, it only makes the soil grow stronger. When you rip out our blossoms, they will grow back and remind us that we can still create beauty. So when you push me down, you push us all down. When you try to bury us, you forget we are the seeds. Thank you very much. Um, this next piece is called, It Took Me a While to Stop Trusting the World's Opinion. <clears throat> Someone once told me that life is measured by the moments that leave us breathless. This cliche is all that I can seem to clinch at while a man sleeps, noxious and meandering, shapeshift into serpents, sewn across each armful of wrinkled and beer-soaked fabric, constricting tighter and tighter. I name him Vasco da Gama. I name him and his five predatory predecessors after colonial explorers who expand their reaches to places they are not welcome to desecrate what my mother taught me was sacred land who day after day continue to be celebrated due to the destiny manifested between the lines of boys will be boys. Someone once told me that ableism doesn't exist, that I was lucky with the special treatment that I am afforded as a little person. Try telling that to Blake Johnston, snatched mid-cigarette and spiked to the ground by a stranger, left paralyzed, it was his birthday to Martin Henderson, set on fire by a drunken party goer. His boss laughed, thought it was a joke. To Adam Smith, slammed head first on a street corner, left for dead by blunt force trauma. Over and over again, I hear the stories of internalized torment metastasized into obligatory introversion after too many Sunday strolls crash into unwanted spectacle. People say I have to pick my battles, but every day is my battle. Every day I am fighting for air, so if to resist is to survive, then every breath is a revolution. If my existence is not in line with the status quo, then it is a defiance of the status quo. If my existence is a defiance of the status quo, then every morning that I wake up, my disfigurement takes the form of a middle finger. I could not help but recall that the world treats me as if something is wrong with me. It took me a while to stop trusting the world's opinion. Thank you all so much. Let me swear. Um, but Jackson, thank you so much for that. Um, and tonight, in addition to Ms. Nikki Patan, we have a very special treat. Mojde Stokely um, is an award-winning writer, poet, performer, photographer, and educator. She's performed in front of thousands and led slam teams to final stages. She's been called the Margaret Cho of poetry. Hmm. Uh, so you will know you'll laugh when she channels her eccentric immigrant parents and you will have conversations with your own empathy when she explores the resilience of a nerdy biracial child who constantly afraid of impending homelessness. She's represented Chicago multiple times at the National Poetry Slam, Individual World Slam, Rust Belt, and Southern Fried Slam, in addition, and executive produced festivals like Lethal Poetry, 
Lethal Poetry's Nights of Sight and Sound, the world's largest mobile art show, Art on Track, and one of Chicago's PSI certified slams, Lethal Poetry. In addition, she also curated, hosted, and produced uh, the National Poetry Slam from, I want to say 2019 or 2018, but Mojde, I'm sure you'll correct me. Her photography, writing, and contributions as a community commentator have been published by Button Poetry and listened to on WBEZ, Vocalo, Alarm Press, Chicago Now, Muzzle Magazine, among others. She's released five albums of music and poetry independently and is a member of Radiant Devices, recently published her first book, Born Into Dissonance, and has an album on the way. When she's not being creative, dynamo, savant, and community leader, she is engaged in HIV prevention research at the University of Illinois Chicago's School of Public Health. Welcome so much. Again, a special treat, Mojde Stokely. Welcome, Mojde. Thank you so much, Andrea. Um, uh, all right. I will just get into it so that we can stay on time and on task. Um, I have three short pieces. Um, the first is called Refinished. It is an erasure poem from a poem called Finished by I. You force the black of disposal open like a mouth saying, ah. You tell me it's the numb. Is it my fear? You're too near, come back. You jerk and give me just enough room. I lean against not looking at you, just staring at feeding station where a woman will confuse you. Verbally at first to quench you. Small rage, then your semi-automatic undress. Listen to hours of static torture for being the man of a nightmare. The first time, remember? It was icy, falling on the roads, driving, staying with you. Outside in my nightgown while you yelled, when you was locked, smashed, but I drove bare, ripped up my sheets a lesson. You wouldn't speak, needed discipline, needed training in the fine art of remaining still, slammed jaw. You taught me how, how ropes, could be tied, how pressure could be applied, cry for mercy tonight, end with shot after shot, how strange it is to be unafraid when the police come, I'm sitting cold as your body, I say he beat me, I do not tell them how the emancipation from pain leaves nothing in its place. The next poem is called False Eyes. Um, it is also on an album that I released with Radiant Devices called Unheeded. Um, the whole album's about trauma and um, resilience um, and when we're not resilient. Um, this piece specifically is an allyship with um, survivors in places American and British soldiers have occupied. Um, um, and this is near a, a particular, inspired by a story near um, a place where I have family. The moth wasn't always a winged face. It didn't always perch or fly or outstretch its fierce flyers. False eyes against hunger, self-protector, self-knowing. She evolved from the burrow. She evolved from the hiding place, chrysalis, from the quiet hunger, the kind that would make the body consume itself, reform. She evolved from the secrets and secrets and secrets. And she prays in the East, but yearns for the West and many men will not live her desperate tries to save her children and mystical dance and dancing follicles and mutter moving antenna until she quietly finds home in the wing folds of many flyers fierce such light the many bends a flutter the many morphed and ever morphing bodies promising to rise near the flames to meet her while her family burns in their weight 
of a refuge to the West. Safety is fluttering and engulfed. These secrets are hidden. She folds fabric modest before each prayer. Even in the occupied camps, she removes her shoes. One woman wrapped in an entire platoon of men, they will always promise to protect her. She, she slips in with insurgents to save her men. But what of her safety? Her husband fears arachnid men, patient as their thirst grows for her settle into soldier's web, insurgent's web. They have secrets, so many secrets while family burns in wait as the West's refuge fled. She prays for her family to be refugees in another place soon, but her son knows what insurgents do when they find who's who, bringing the occupiers to their fighting flames. We become the fire's promise as we hover before its gaze. We are pulled to the flutter of the heat, we are the flutter of the heat. We are pulled to the flutter of the heat. We are the flutter of the heat. Fold the fabric, conceal her name, conceal her purpose, conceal her lips. Fold fabric secrets so no one would know her. And the last piece is called Make the Order. This rank is holy. I can baptize myself with each cloak of the heavens, royal blue Huntsville flight suit custom patches, commander like a title given to me by men or God or men who think they're gods, but men will never be gods even if martial men mistake themselves for masters. Compliance does not concede permission, rights or privilege. Their hands cannot control these heavens though they try. I have landed safely now, stationed bravely in the mission, in the I own this crater, in the respect my rank private, in the ask me first, in the I know this now. I tell my students they can call me commander. It's an excuse to have soft conversations about gender identity, chosen names, self-assurance, and fighting imposter syndrome. It didn't start that way, but turned out to be the answer to no miss, please, no miss, please, no mister, please, commander. This rank was earned after suborned and sanctioned. I have made myself from the push-ups and exercise in not drowning under the weight of the institution's compulsory components, G-force spin in this royal blue Huntsville flight suit custom patches say, Commander. I know this is cosplay. It didn't start that way, but turned out to be the answer. I know that these rank pips and embroidered letters and heat embossed wings are merely things I design and make to order. No one makes ceremony or appointment or offers me purple hearts for my PTSD. Is it so different when requesting social security remove a husband's or father's or slave master's surname so that your documents are no longer branded? or when you ask for the police report to read assault instead of simple battery. Sign the paperwork, make the order. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mojde. Um, so I, I want to, there, there's a few more readers to go on, but I want to highlight the idea, uh, the fact that Mojde, I noticed that you had uh, turquoise ribbon in your braids and uh, Nikki's hair is dyed turquoise and um, you'll see other folks with turquoise on. And that color is to highlight um, sexual awareness month. Um, I think somebody pointed out earlier that uh, in the city of Chicago tonight, if you can see the tops of buildings, they are highlighted in turquoise to honor uh, survivors uh, on behalf of Sexual Awareness Month. 
So I wanted to note if you see that sort of similarity in colors, that's why. Um, and I want to introduce our next uh, writer, uh, Sante Harden Tate. And she is uh, Black, American, Chicago, West Side native, creative writer, advocate, community educator, proud mother of two, and a wife with a deep rooted passion for healing, advocating, and educating the community on trauma. Sante teaches the community about sexual abuse, sexual violence, body safety, and the rights of survivors as a community educator. Sante has an affinity for the uplifting and educating of the community on the traumas and struggles that disproportionately affect black, black, the Black community. Much respect, Sante. Thank you so much and welcome, everyone. Sante Harden Tate. Good evening, everyone, and I'll hop right in with my first piece, and I call this piece Children's Games. What games did you play as a child? One of the games I was often broke into was house. Have you ever played that game? I would always be asked to be the mama. I bring my baby dolls, and I was the proud mother of four beautiful black babies. I lovingly acted out scenes from my real mama's script because I am the mama, and that's what mamas do. But being the mama in a game of house wasn't was more than just spoon feedings and pretend food to close mouths and hearing make-believe cries of one of my plastic babies or wiping their invisible tears from their stony painted eyes as one of them rolled onto the floor and their heavy plastic kids bumped against the wood being mama in a game of house meant more apparently touching fathering of prepubescent chest and trying to open my pocketbook, which I was told was not for begging hands and playing house mint, rubbing, and my innocence too naive to comprehend I was pleasing someone in places I never should have been. And the fun I could never find in house. It always got real. Maybe plastic children pulled me to the ground were cries for help to protect my doll's innocence. The tears weren't invisible. They are real. The thousands of tears of mamas and that, that are trapped in games of house and in real houses and in the world and lost in the secrets of the game. That was real. And no one prepared you for that game. And when it wasn't a game anymore, and how to tell and when to tell, because only adults hurt kids like that. Not children playing a game, but it is real. And no one prepares little mamas with baby dolls about how house should be limited to little teacups and keeping my soul babies from touching the play stove. Have you ever played house like I played house? Well, let me tell you this, man. That was abuse. No one tell your children not to play that game. I found out as a real mama that my real mama was both into that game too. And still she never thought I'd be in a situation where I'd be asked, do you want to be the mama? That's all for that one. Um, go to my next piece. It's called No Respite. Sorry, I think I'm getting, it says my sound is crackly, so let me say. Is this better? All right. <laughs> Sorry about that, y'all. I'll go into the next piece, and it's called No Respite. The hardest part about being in a room full of people is being invisible. They don't see you, they see your smile. They watch the corners of your lips curve towards the sky, unknowingly aware of the muck and barbed wired emotions your corners crawl through to reach for the unattainable happiness that everyone keeps telling you exists. If you just believe. They don't see you, they see a mask. 
It hides the filth left streaking, streaking down your face, salted, bitter, disgusting drops of grief running down, carving lines of defeat in your cheeks, scratching, scraping, drying, running, drip drops of struggle to be normal, to be everything that they need, that you need, and no one sees. They don't see you, they see your being, your existence in a space, oblivious to the unlevel structure, standing lopsided leaning tower of functioning dysfunction that they marvel at that they don't see you in a room you are invisible they see you floating they call it grace they call it strength and hope and reliability add fucking moration a light safety a safe place to be a mess and validate and validate it and a chance to dump all of their shit on your back a concierge for their struggles and pain and valet for organizing parking and lining up straight all of their vehicles of shit, not realizing the vehicular slaughter of your own preservation or your jumbled garage of pain. And they thank you and they don't see you in a space. They see strength because you have a story that people have heard the pieces of and they know you have been through something. They see you surviving and call it wondrous, not knowing survival comes at a cost, leaving you soaked and stained in self-loathing, self-doubt, and self-worthlessness because they need you and you are needed. So you must survive to revive them through emotional and spiritual CPR. Breathe inside of them. Fill them with your breaths. Pump one, two, three. Breathe in with your breaths. Pump one, two, three. Check posts. Are they better? Breathe into them with your breaths. Pump one, two, three. Check. You watch their bodies take in your air. They remove themselves from the metaphysical floor like sprouting tulips from the earth. You have breathed into them, and now they emerge from the grips of spiritual peril, refreshed, rebirthed, reborn, revived, and you are cherished for your abilities, but they don't see you. Didn't see the sweat rippling from beyond your mouth, perspiration of brokenness and tiredness and loneliness and fear and doubt and tired and needing and weakness, fragility. They don't see you in a room, space, air, world, here, there. You are invisible. The manifestation of hope that they need to carry on to make it from today until tomorrow they don't see you breaking, bleeding through the cracks of your shell, the pain you hide with a smile, the shattering of your soul, growing cracks of help me, spilling out into the air, drowning me in my silent screaming, muffled by laughter you gave them in the form of a parody of my actual self. Your unnoticeable cries for help, the hand you extended to lift yourself, but they grab it and lift themselves. They don't see you. The hidden messages written in between the love you give, the read between the lines, they don't see anything. You are invisible. You are invincible. You are impervious to humanity. They don't see you. They see the healer, but healers need healing too. That's all I got for y'all. Thank y'all for hearing me. So Santa, can you do me a favor since we were challenged a little bit? Can you read your first piece over? Will do. The first piece, and I apologize for that crackling, it is called Children's Games. What games did you play as a child? One of the games I was often roped into was house. Have you ever played? I would always get asked to be the mama. I bring my baby dolls and I was the proud mother of four black beautiful babies. I lovingly acted out scenes from my real mama script because I am the mama and that's what mamas do. But being a mama in the game of house was more than spoon feedings of pretend food to close mouths and hearing make believe cries of one of my plastic babies or wiping their invisible tears from their stoic painted eyes after one of them rolled onto the floor and their heavy plastic heads dumped against the wood. Being mama in a game of house meant more, apparently touching fondling of prepubescent chests and trying to open my pocketbook, which I was told was not for begging hands and rubbing my innocence too naive to comprehend that I was pleasing someone in places I never should have been. House, it always got real. Maybe plastic babies plummeting to the ground were cries for help to protect my doll's innocence. The tears weren't invisible. 
they are real. The thousands of tears of mamas that were trapped in the game of house and in real houses and in the world and lost in the secrets of the game, that was real, that no one prepared you for that game and when it wasn't a game anymore and how to tell and when to tell because only adults hurt kids like that, not children playing a game, but it is real. And no one prepares little mamas with black baby dolls about how house should be limited to little teacups and keeping my faux babies from touching my play stove. Have you ever played house? Like I've played house? Well, let me tell you this then. That was abuse. No go and tell your children not to play that game. I found out as a real mama that my real mama was roped into that game too. And she still never thought that I'd be in a situation where I'd be asked to. You want to be the mama? That's it, y'all. Thank you for repeating that. I'm glad we had a chance to hear that. I'm going to move on to our next person, just because there's so many of you that are so vital. Ona is a writer, artist, educator, and restorative justice practitioner. Their work explores the intersection between social identities, building solidarity between movements, and the personal as political. They are committed to addressing complex and community trauma through restorative justice and creative arts. They use storytelling as grassroots organizing, oral history and personal narratives are tools that build community as well as solidarity. Ona volunteers at Resilience on the planning committee for Men in the Movement, discussion series aimed at helping male identified people recognize their roles in stopping sexism and rape culture while also acknowledging the ways men and boys are hurt by them. Besides writing, we know that they also enjoy photography, painting, ceramics, travel, and learning. Welcome everybody, Ona. Thank you so much. I have two pieces to share with you today. This piece is called Show Me a Man. Show me a man who has never pushed when someone said no, who has never covered up violence, who has never sheltered an abuser, who has never been so afraid to face the truth that he turned his back. Show me a man who has never made of someone soft and inanimate thing by ignoring voice or choice or humanity, who has never seen a body as an object to own, who has never seen a mind as a barrier to break. Show me a man who has never let his friend take the drunk home, who has never lied about his past relationships, his partner, the last time he was tested, who has never covered for a friend caught in these lies. Show me a man who doesn't brag about sex with partners who wouldn't say the same. Show me a man who doesn't see Asian or Latina or Black or Middle Eastern and think of our mouths as spices to taste. Our bodies are not a trip down the ethnic aisle at the grocery store. You cannot sample us. Show me a man who notices when someone needs a ride home or needs someone to interrupt unwanted advances or an alibi or a safe place, but doesn't get angry when a survivor did not accept these things who doesn't blame a survivor for someone else's actions. Show me a man who doesn't ask, why didn't she leave? But instead, why didn't he love? Show me a man who doesn't take it personally when a woman puts up her guard around him. Show me a man who doesn't make excuses when his advances are unwanted, who doesn't say, I was just trying to be polite, don't flatter yourself when rejected. Who doesn't say, you're ugly anyway, when cat calls solicit scowls. Show me a man who has never forged the past into battle acts out of anger at someone he's supposed to love. Show me a man, gay or straight, who doesn't think his opinion of a woman's body is needed. Show me a man who has never responded with interrogation when gifted the opportunity to listen. 
Show me a man who has never stayed neutral. When neutral means staying silent instead of saying, I believe you. When neutral means not admitting fault. When neutral means you get to bump to the same music, read the same books, pay the same artists, watch the same movies, laugh at the same jokes, tailgate the same playoffs, attend the same classes, vote for the same politicians, and never change your mind. This is not a call out. This is a call in. Survivors are not just sisters, mothers, daughters, sons, girlfriends, boyfriends, cousins. Survivors are human beings. Abusers are brothers, fathers, sons, daughters, boyfriends, girlfriends, cousins. When you say boys will be boys, how are you defining boy? To condone boys will be boys is to condemn men. Boys are 30% more likely to flunk or drop out than girls. One in 20 boys experience abusive sexual experiences before age 18, but are even less likely than girls to report it. We teach men that carelessness is confidence, but a carefree man is liberated by a clear conscience. 80% of violent crime arrests are men. 80% of people arrested for offenses against families and children are men. 90% of convicted murderers are men, while 86% of homicide victims aged 10 to 24 years old are boys. How can you let a man poison himself with toxicity? How can you let someone squeeze into a definition so narrow it's suffocating? Love without accountability doesn't add up. How can you love someone while denying his capacity for love? Do you not believe men capable of being better than everything mentioned in these lines? Who really hates men? When you say, I'm one of the nice guys, who are you comparing yourself to? Who have you allowed to burn so that their smoke would screen your intentions? Love men by believing they are capable of so much more than our shelter allows them to be. Show me a man who has chosen to grow instead of growl and I will show you a feminist, an ally, someone with a backbone, a real man. What does it take to teach a community to hold him accountable, to hold him when he's too afraid to admit he's afraid? Real men transcend the confines of violence, release the pressure of repression before it explodes. To atone is to be at one with those you have harmed, at one, with your inner being, at one with your community? What does it take to teach a community to hold a man from every side? Thank you so much, Ona. I really appreciate that um, and that perspective. Uh, it's so vitally important. And I apologize, my dog is drinking water very loudly. Um, our next performer is Cheryl Nell Lane. She is an author, speaker, advocate, and facilitator and performer. She uses words to create incredible worlds, stories, and experiences. Dubbed the poetic storyteller because her poetry tells a story and her stories are also poetic. Lane's written work has transcended genres and covers a multitude of topics and emotions. She's not afraid to discuss trauma, sadness, joy, and laughter in the same session. Her company, Cheryl Lane LLC Relates, advocates and uplifts Black women. In 2020, Lane created Words from a Black Woman's Experience, a live interactive weekly podcast where women come to share their stories boldly and unapologetically. If you're further interested, you can reach out to Cheryl Nell at www.cherylnell.com. That's C-H-E-R-L-N-E-L-L.com. So everyone, welcome, Chernell. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Um, I'll be reading two pieces. The first piece I'll be reading is called Little Fast Girl. Innocence. Mama, he hurt me. Touched me where he shouldn't have. Climbed on top of me and put his penis in my vagina. 
forced it in when it didn't fit to use his lips to kiss away my tears. Please send him away to quiet my fears. I'm afraid this is just going to repeat. It's taking over my thoughts and invading my dreams. Unicorns and talking animals I no longer imagine. Only the boogeyman sneaking into my room again like an assassin. Mother dearest. Who, him? Now you know he wouldn't do anything of the cat. Girl, you tricked. Have you lost your man? Must have been running around with your butt hanging out. Oh, I see. Now that you're starting to sprout, got knobs on your chest and a few hairs on your mouth, trying to tell me he came sniffing around, saying that my man wants you because you offered up your cookie and he didn't chew. What I tell you about being fast, little girl, shouldn't have been so cute and desirable. Brought it all upon yourself, making up stories about good, respectable men. Trying to seduce them with things you ain't got. It's not their fault you walk around so hot. She stayed in a child's place. Abuse. That ain't the case. Songbird. I met him at a burger spot. Now he picks me up from school. I can't believe he likes someone like me. I mean, he's so cool. We hung out at the studio, which became my second home. Then one day, he called for me to go through a private door. My life forever changed. The lines quickly blurred. He treats me so badly. But it must be what I deserve. Yeah, I'm only 14. But he loves me anyway. I mean, he's the adult. So he'll tell me if it wasn't okay. Fan mail. How dare you say you didn't know it was wrong? You just wanted to have sex after his month, accepting the checks. You let him pick you up from school. Your parents didn't fret. Huh? That's what your little ass get. Yeah, most of his songs were written about you. But those are the songs I made my children to. You underage women shouldn't be so weak. And why y'all choosing now to come out and speak? What we tell you about being fast, little girl, shouldn't have been so cute and desirable. Brought it all upon yourself. Making up stories about good, respectable men. Trying to seduce them with things you ain't got. It's not their fault you walk around so hot. Should have stayed in a child's place. Abuse? You have no case. Lost child. Someone snatched me up. I was 10, took me somewhere I didn't know. Joe found me and saved me. He helped me grow, taught me to earn my keep, bring in money to hold my place. He showed me how to lay <laughs> and brought me pretty late. My first time, the man was bigger than me. I never done anything like this before. I was so afraid that my knees started shaking. 
and I almost hit the floor. So I turned to run, but there were the girls who came and held me down. I was pushed so deep in the street life that I started to drown. Rap sheet. I found this whore on Canal Street trying to get rid of the murder weapon. She looks really young. It should be easy to get a confession. Bitch says it was self-defense, but she's still going to get tried as an adult. You know how money-hungry hookers are. Probably robbed the guy, and he died as a result. She whined about being forced into prostitution, but I don't believe her. If she left, got a real job, none of this had to occur. Probably ran away from home because she was an out-of-control kid. Well, it's a shame because now she's going to do a bit. Sentence. What they tell you about being fast, little girl, shouldn't have been so cute and desirable. You brought it all upon yourself, making up stories about good, respectable men, trying to seduce them with things you ain't got, it's not their fault you walked around so hot. Should have stayed in a child's place. Abuse. Uh, now you got the case. So that's that first piece. Sorry, people. Okay. The next piece is called My Paradox. How can you be the victim of a crime and still the one at fault? How can a secret still be a secret if you tell everyone you know? How can someone too weak to hold a child carry the burdens of a man? It's too confusing to comprehend. How can I be over something? When I think about it every day, as I cry, dry tears that stream down my face, can't show too much real emotion, might get figured out. Step into my paradox. Helping everyone else to prevent helping myself. It's a trick no one sees but me. Like children playing hide and go seek. The only place you can find me are in these words. I speak my peace, verbs and noun, brain and soul me. Around the bend, here we go again. Step into my paradox. It's time for me to let it go. And I try to every day. But I've got to do it in my way. Travel with me or stay behind? Am I a good girl or am I bad? Feel my feelings happy or sad? A smile on my face doesn't mean I'm glad. And <laughs> about a laughter might mean I'm mad. Step into my paradise. A winding road under a rickety bridge, slippery slope, and I have slid a bumpy path with a fork in a road. Navigation on Spanish mode. Am I up or am I down? A brand new queen with a broken crown. I want this feeling to go away. I want to leave. I can't stay. Step into my paradox. I'm releasing the best way I know how. I'm putting pen to pad and I'm writing this thing down. I'm no longer holding on. I want to be free. So I'm breaking out of my paradox. Wow, Chanel, thank you so much. And you know, uh, 
thanks for breaking it down and keeping it real for us. Um, that's uh, some powerful stuff. I want to apologize for two things. Number one, um, I want to, I think when I said uh, this month, April was sexual awareness, it's sexual assault awareness month. So I apologize. And again, if you see everybody wearing turquoise, it's a reminder for us to uh, in recognition of Sexual Assault Awareness Month. Um, and also, um, I think I jumped the gun and I cut Ona off. So I wanted to give Ona a chance to read her second piece. So Ona, if you could go on and read your second piece. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, this, this last piece is called Epitaph for the Living. What indulgence to have hobbies instead of battles? What reverence for name to be mouthful, not bite-sized chunks, gummed gristle? What satisfaction to chew what if without bitter aftertaste? What liberation to be bold in moonlight, not shrink from slinking indigo shadows? What license to know body as fortress, not forfeit or barter? What simplicity to be more than a name, to settle into draping arms, grow into your sagging belly, smile stretched across the constellation of your teeth? What immunity to meet fear the moment heart stops and not its reverse? to find respite only in rest. What ease to grow old, then forgetful, instead of remembered as potential. What contentment to deteriorate, watch the next generation outpace you, outgrow you. Students teach you instead of saying your name. What luxury to be wrong, instead of dead? What freedom to ask yourself how you want to be remembered instead of becoming activist in death, instead of becoming martyr with last breath? What joy to be remembered for what you say in life instead of your last words? Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful that you were able to get that included in the um, program. Uh, thank you for uh, doing that for us. And <clears throat> so as we wrap up uh, the authors this evening, I want to uh, bring back Nikki Patten, who again is the founder and the executive director for Surviving the Mic. And I also want to thank Nikki for so much for bringing all of these folks and these voices together this evening. Uh, so Nikki, uh, if you could do your piece, welcome. Thank you, Andrea. Um, and thank you everybody who's read tonight. You guys are amazing. It's always such a pleasure um, to hear everybody read. Um, and I just also appreciate your generosity um, in sharing these pieces um, because they are not easy uh, to read or to share. Um, folks are dropping their social media handles in the chat. So make sure that you jump on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, the whole situation, follow people, follow their work, support their work. Everybody got a cash app, a Venmo, a Zelle, a PayPal, you know, work that out, um, you know, and just support um, survivors who, again, are being generous um, and, and sharing their lived experiences, their creative expression with all of us, um, because it really is a gift. Um, this is my final piece. This is uh, more of a prose piece. Uh, this is called Change I Wish to See. I have been angry for as long as I can remember. Where does all this rage come from? I haven't known or understood until now. My rage comes from being hurt over and over again and no one being moved to action by my pain. There is a specific kind of fury that comes from harm done, no one doing anything to heal the pain and further, no one doing anything to prevent the harm from happening again. In fact, 
the specific kinds of violence I've experienced seem very necessary to both present and past world orders. The violence of racism, the insidiousness of sexism and massage noir, the persistence of rape, the viciousness of homophobia and transphobia, the cruelty of ableism, the inevitability of sizeism and ageism, and the relentless grind demanded by classism all coalesce in my body and lived experiences and have left me harmed. They've also left those around me, those who say they love me, willfully unaffected because I can see that they've been harmed too, but they won't. It's a conscious ignorance. The decided apathy that infuriates me, it is how we stand back casually and decide that someone's pain, so many people's trauma, <laughs> whole cultures of millions suffering are just not enough to change anything. Every time I've been bloodied and bruised by someone else's desire for power, control, dominance, obedience, assimilation, both literal and metaphorical, eyebrows do not raise, mouths do not drop, Tears are not shed. Every time I articulate that I am scared or upset or hurt, I am told that I am fine, that this or that is not a big deal. That far worse is happening to some nameless, faceless other. And therefore, whatever has happened to me is not that big of a deal. It's not a deal at all or a deal breaker. People who call themselves my friends or family or loved ones have had no problem breaking bread with, sharing jokes, pages posed for pictures and stages with and signing paychecks for someone who has harmed me. People who call themselves activists or educators or social justice minded or liberation centered or advocates actively defend those who have been accused of and sometimes admitted to harming others via rape, harassment, physical violence and violences that have yet to be named. It is a hard lesson to learn, but natural is evolution, that the world is oriented towards and designed and built for and by predators. And so I stay enraged. I ask questions with impossible answers like, when do I get the world built for me? When will what has happened to me, the harm I've experienced be enough to move the people I love to tears, to care, concern, to action? When will the people I advocate for and with and the harm they experience be enough to shift dollars from the accounts of harm doers to the accounts of the harm to shift support from predators to survivors. When will, be, when will we be considered human enough to matter? And all the only response I get is silence. Someone, most folks, will call me maudlin, say I'm overdramatic, too sensitive, but what are emotions but to acknowledge the impact of the extremes of the human experience. What is more extreme than torn flesh, windpipe closed between someone else's fingers, eyes purple with blood brought right to the surface of, but trapped underneath the most delicate skin of the body. I've looked in the mirror at myself, staring at the aftermath of the harm I've just listed above and known that no one would care what happened, that I'd just be blamed for letting it happen, shamed, judged, and then silence, because no one wants to hear that shit. What matters more than a spirit frozen numb by violence layered onto violence and then freezer burned by systems purporting justice, but never actually giving it. At two, I learned to read. At 12, I wrote my first thesis. At 21, I dropped out of college. I said I left to be a poet, but that was just the PTSD speaking for me protecting me from telling the truth, but more so from knowing that the telling of the truth would only take away and not give me what I wanted and needed, understanding, empathy for somebody to do something, anything for somebody to fight for me and say what I went through was not okay, that it wouldn't happen on their watch, for someone to care enough, love enough for there to be a watch, to watch over me and watch out for me. Instead, I pretended that I was more artistic than traumatized more a free spirit than a broken one. I pretended that I was more of a wild child than an abused child. I became more of a bully than a victim, preferring to destroy people with my tongue rather than stick around long enough to let them shatter a heart so full of cracks that I regularly spit blood bitter and hot and then brush the fuck out of my teeth so I can smile pretty and pretend some more. I'm not a dream deferred, but a truth denied. I am a story that the world would prefer not to read or hear the bitch constantly killing the vibe, 
I know now what happened to me. And if no one else knows or listens or cracks my spine to read me, I know what happened. What happened is that I was hurt over and over again in ways known and unknown and nobody ever thought it mattered. My blackness, my fatness, my femme, my queer erasing me and making me and the harm done not matter. But I know and it happened. I know and it is a big deal. I know and I want people in the world to change because of it. I know the change I want to see in the world. And I am so mad that I, my harm and the harm of so many others is not enough to change anything. People stay quoting a predator about the change they wish to see in the world, which I find ironic and more fuel for my rage. I have consistently been that change, tempering my rage with healing, offsetting my own desires for violence as revenge with desires for radical peace and expansive empathy. I am the change. I wish to see in the world, but I am not the only one who needs changing. Thank you. I think there's a line that poets talk about. They said, if it's bleed, it's, it's, it's something that is worthy for the page. And I wanna say that um, thank you all for, for bleeding. Um, with your words, with your feelings, with your stories, with um, everything that you had to offer this evening. Um, I wanna remind everybody that you can uh, follow Surviving the Mic at Surviving the Mic um, on Twitter, uh, Surviving the Mic on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Tumblr. In addition to Sexual Awareness Month, April is also National Poetry Month. So if you have a moment, take a moment, and write something down. Um, a lot of the folks have posted their um, information in the chat. Uh, Nikki Patan at Nick Star One, and uh, Mojde Stokely at the Mojde at uh, on IG. Uh, Sante's got a weekly show called Oh We Gonna Talk, which I love. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, we gonna talk. That should be a national <laughs> show. Oh yeah. Need that. You need mm -hmm. that one. Um, and just to point out that uh, it's about the generational curses in the Black community. And you can follow that also on Facebook on uh, Are We Going to Talk? Um, so uh, I want to thank everybody for taking part in this and, uh, again, sharing your feelings and telling your stories. Um, I want to thank the Chicago Alliance Against Sexual Exploitation for partnering with us and for surviving the mic for honoring us with their presence and allowing us to host this event. Again, for those of you who don't know, my name is Andrea Change. I'm the executive director for the Guild Literary Complex. We are honored this evening to present this to you. If you feel so moved and wish to make a donation, I've already given you the information for Surviving the Mic. You can follow them there, or you can also go to the Guild Complex uh, at guildcomplex.org and make a donation there. Past events and information about the Guild Complex is located there uh, right now. This concludes our programming for the month of April, but look forward in May, we will have a special event on May 19th with Reginald Gibbons, Ed Roberson, and Angela Jackson, our Illinois Poet Laureate um, on the 19th. More information will be posted on our website forthcoming, um, but look for that. Uh, and I wanna thank everybody for taking part. Uh, if you have not been moved, um, you should be. And also, um, if you are or have been a victim of sexual assault or sexual trauma, um, you can reach out to the case at kcaase.org um, for information. Also, our community guidelines have been published, so there's access there. And you can also go to Surviving Mike. Thank you to everyone for participating. Thank you for all who uh, sat in our audience. Everybody have a wonderful evening. Have a good night. <laughs>